So, so hi, everyone. So then, first of all, a very warm welcome from my side. Welcome and a good evening to this rather spontaneous uh, MOOC Plus Plus meetup. So probably I should explain why we only announced this a couple of days ago. Uh, I think this was not even a week ago. Um, so approximately uh, a little more than a week ago, CPPCon finally sent their, um, their invitations, their acceptance notifications for talks. And I have the great honor and pleasure that this talk he was accepted for CPPCon. But so was a lot of other talks um, by many other people. And you might have already seen that there is now some kind of lineup starting to uh, take shape of people who would like to give their talk, uh, to practice their talk uh, in this user group. So you can probably expect that we add one or perhaps even two more talks um, before CPPCon. So the next couple of weeks will be rather crowded. But since, well, you can decide what talks to take, this is probably not a big issue. So this talk was indeed selected for CPPCon. If you're now expecting that this is a talk about the latest changes and the most complex features about function calls, then probably the expectation here is wrong. My intention was indeed to just talk about the basics of calling functions. One of the reasons why I suggested such a talk was because there is indeed no other talk that deals with these things. Yeah, name lookup, overload resolution, there virtually is nothing comparable to um, other talks. The second reason why I talk about this topic is that I frequently realize that the people in my training classes do not really have a firm grasp of the mechanics behind calling functions. So which function is called? How is the compiler det uh, determining the, the right function to call? And so I decided that it would be a pretty good idea. I even uh, suggested this for a back to basics talk, but because there were so many other suggestions, unfortunately didn't make it. Luckily it uh, did make it into the main program. And so this is what uh, this evening I'll talk about. So once again, if you're expecting something very high level, you might be a little disappointed, but I hope that in these uh, 60 minutes, I can actually fill the gaps that you might have. And I hope that everybody who, um, then watches this talk has a pretty good idea how compilers deal with function calls. So Roland already introduced me, um, so there's nothing more to add here. Indeed, how and my money is mostly with C++ trainings, um, but uh, indeed one of the most pleasurable tasks I do is organizing this user group. So what I'm planning to do here is to go through the individual steps of calling functions. So we'll, for instance, talk about name lookup. We'll talk uh, about overload resolution, excess labels, etc. And all of these individual steps are in, in themselves pretty complex, surprisingly complex sometimes, which however also um, is one of the reasons why I cannot really go into every single step in full detail. 60 minutes are a rather short time frame. So unfortunately, I'll not be able to go into detail about template argument deduction, including the Sweeney mechanism, and I'll also skip virtual dispatch. Now, the, second, the, the first topic is probably just too complex for 60 minutes and the other stuff. And I believe that virtual dispatch is something that you're pretty familiar with. I don't have to explain something that basic. But I will go into detail about all the other things. And afterwards, hopefully you have a pretty good idea why certain things happen as they do and why some surprising effects um, uh, exist. So let me give you an overview first of the individual steps that we'll cover. The very first step that happens in, uh, in, uh, in function calling and calling functions is name lookup. At first, the compiler has to figure out if there is any function with the according name. At this point, it's not about arguments at all. It truly just is about the name. And really, this is name lookup. So it's not just functions that are picked up at this point. The compiler could also find variables uh, or anything else, like types, for instance, with a coding name. I simplify this a little bit. I assume the best. I assume that there is functions that, in, uh, that we find uh, and not variables, types, etc. But the end result of name lookup should be a set of so-called candidate functions, the functions that could possibly be called. No decision is made here at this point which function will be called. Some of these functions, however, may actually function templates. These function templates, the ones that have been selected as candidates, are now instantiated and uh, increase the overload set. 
some of these templates might not work at all. Thanks to the so-called Sphini mechanism, they are discarded right away, so they do not really add to the set of candidate functions. But else, some of the templates definitely will increase the set of candidate functions. If after the template argument deduction, I have at least two functions that are, um, th that I have, oh, okay, at least one, so else nothing would work, but at least two that I could call, then I have to make a decision. Which of these two functions is better? The job of overload resolution is to make a decision because only one function ultimately can be called. And so I have to strip down the set of candidate functions to the so-called viable candidate functions and then to the so-called best match. So the result of the overload resolution is then exactly one function, the function that I intend to call. That function, however, might actually be hidden behind a private or protected access label. Depending from where I call the function, this may be um, a reason to say, no, you cannot call a function. So I have to make another decision. Am I allowed to call the selected function? Some of the fun if the function that I have chosen, the best match, results from a template, then there may be function template specializations. So at this point, I make a decision which of these specializations are actually better suited or be best suited. Uh, note, this is happening pretty late in the process, which is pretty surprising for many people. And if I now have selected the according function template, then of course, Perhaps it wasn't a template, perhaps it was just a virtual member function. Then I, of course, also have to deal with virtual dispatch. What's actually the at runtime best fun or right function to call? Last but not least, it could also be that the selected function is deleted. This is, of course, a function that I cannot call either because a deleted function should not be called. So even this step could result in a compilation error. Altogether, you see, there is a lot of in, uh, individual steps until I finally can really make a decision that some function is called. So I now go through all of these in detail. There's, however, one final remark to this overview. Please consider this algorithm as a strict one-way street. If name lookup comes up with a result, so delivers a couple of candidate functions, and somewhere later, I realized that none of these functions can be called. I do never go back to name lookup, find another function and try that one. As soon as name lookup is finished, there is no turning back. If later I come up with the resolution, I cannot call these functions. It's always a compilation error, a hard compilation error in the according step. So this is one of the first pretty important points uh, to remember about calling functions. All right, let's dive into the individual steps. And the first one is name lookup. So as I said before, the task of name lookup is to find the right fun uh, any function with the according name. No, not the right function, any function with the according name. So let's start simple. Let's assume that in um, the global namespace, we have a function f that takes a double and that it, we have an additional namespace called n1 with a function f that takes an integer. So functions are just named one and two. In the main function, I now call f with a 1.0. Okay, without much surprise, this definitely calls function one. However, not just because the argument matches nicely. No, imagine for instance that I call f with a 42. This does also call function one, despite the fact that it's actually, that I actually have an argument of type int and that I have to convert it to a double. Function two is never found by the name lookup if I call function f without any further information and without any kind of qualification. Namespace n1 is never entered. I look for the right name from that function, uh, from that point on, so I only look in the global namespace. There's just one function, no question here. If I really want to find function n, uh, f, then I have to explicitly qualify this at this point. So please call n1, the colon colon f. This calls function two, simply because I explicitly ask for it. The first two calls are named unqualified lookup. The third call is called qualified lookup. Unqualified lookup essentially says to the compiler, please figure out the best function to call from here, from this call site. 
qualified lookup on the other hand says I am want I want this particular function to be called or I want a particular function from that namespace to be called. This is different and it definitely have, has different implications. So for instance, let's assume that uh, I get rid of the function in the N1 namespace. Now the first two function calls are exactly the same as before, function one is called, but the N1F call, the third one is suddenly ill-formed. There is no F in N1. If I specifically ask for this particular function, this will always result in a compilation error. Name lookup will not find anything. Now let's make this a little more interesting. In N1, I have my function two back, but additionally I have two functions called G and H. G calls N1 colon colon F with a 1.0 and H calls F without qualification with a 1.0. In the main function, I call N1 G. This here is an explicit qualified function call again to F. So no question that this will always call function two. But interestingly, call to H will result in the same function F to be called. I am looking for a function F from this point on. Well, this is a function in namespace N1. So the first place to look is the namespace N1. And name lookup indeed finds a function F. That must be it. That's kind of the reasoning of name lookup. This function is never picked up. It's not seen. It's kind of invisible from the name, uh, point of view of name lookup. So we call this hiding. Function two hides function one. It just isn't seen. It's never considered. It cannot be chosen later. So this uh, results in function two. If I get rid of, uh, so not get rid, if I change the argument in function two. So for instance, instead of taking an int, now it takes a string then both function calls are suddenly ill-formed and I do not um, have a successful function call. Name lookup just finds function two in both cases. Only later I realized that I cannot convert a double to a string. And as I said before, it's a strict one-way street. If the name lookup only comes out of a function two and this doesn't work, it is a hard compilation error. I do not go back and try to find function one. Yeah? So go to the next scope, the global scope, find another F. So hiding is indeed a pretty important uh, aspect when we deal with name lookup. This is definitely something to keep in mind. Now, if I remove this function, then of course, both function calls, uh, again, try to find the according F. The first function call, however, is ill-formed. There is not, no F in N. And the second one now finally finds function one. This, however, only finds function one because the compiler does not pick any other F in N1. There is no F. If the compiler is empty in a certain scope, does not find an according function, then and only then it proceeds to the next scope, which in the simple example is just the global namespace. Function one is detected, considered, and later selected to be the best match. So. Remember that hiding is indeed an important aspect of name lookup. Now, just for the sake of completeness, I got rid of this N1 here, else the situation is uh, just as in the beginning. Now, of course, qualified lookup will call function one and the unqualified lookup calls function two. Note that if I add a third function after G and H, this function does not change anything about which function is found. One other aspect of name lookup is that only those functions are considered that have already been seen at the uh, point of the function call. Function three, taking a double, has not been seen at this point, so I can only consider function one and two, if, if any. Function three never is an option. Let's make this even more interesting by adding a struct S to namespace N1. So this S has yet another F. So this one takes an int and is called function three. And I have a function G, which calls F with a 1.0. Additionally, I have yet another F after S, my function four, so F4. In the main function, first of all, I create an S, 
and then I call s.g. From a calling point of g, um, so a calling point of this f here, I should say, um, the only option first is function three. As I said before, name lookup starts in the scope where I call the function. It's in the scope of s. So I start looking in the scope of f, s. Oh, there's actually an f inside s. So this is the only function at a scene. This time, um, function three hides both function two and one. Function three is the only option that I can choose later. If I get rid of three, then there is no f in, in the scope of s. And I go to the next scope, which is the namespace scope. I find an f again, but only function two, not function four again. So function two is called. This time, two just hides one. And if I get rid of two, then um, I also don't find anything in namespace n1. I go and proceed till the global namespace, find function one, and finally, this is the right one, uh, I call function one. No hiding here. Okay. So far, I have used integers and doubles only. However, the story becomes a little more interesting if we consider class types. Let's assume that I still have this s, this time it's empty, um, but I additionally provide a function f that takes an s. In the main function, I um, actually uh, create an s and call function f with s. This time, perhaps surprisingly, I do not call function one. I indeed call the right function. I call function three. This mechanism is called argument Argument dependent lookup, or short ADL. Argument dependent lookup is a mechanism that helps to find the right thing if you have a class type, a user defined type in a specific namespace. Because if I call f with s, and s is from the namespace in one, then very likely this is the right function to call. And so the namespace in one is considered. For, so I also search for f in namespace n1 because the argument that I pass to the function is from the namespace n1. This is an, a mechanism that you basically use all the time. If you ever wondered um, why the output operator actually works, so a standard C out, and you, for instance, print a string, this is because of argument dependent lookup. Of course, the output operator for a string is also in standard namespace, and it is found because both arguments are from the standard namespace. So this is a pretty fundamental mechanism in order to make, make uh, namespaces and class user-defined types work well. Let's assume that I additionally add a function g. g is not just a function, it's a function template, and g takes some t. This t is given to f. So I call function f with t. Also in this case, I actually call function three. Although, and that is the nice addition here, function three is defined after g. Yeah, even the entire namespace n1 is defined after um, the, um, the function g. That is again because of argument dependent lookup. In a first pass through the code, the template can only be um, syntactically parsed, the compiler recognizes the fact that some f is called. However, later when it is instantiated, this is of type s. And the same mechanism applies again. The argument is of type n1s, and I'm considering namespace n1 to uh, call a function. Let's assume that I add a fourth function perhaps accidentally, perhaps I wanted to test something, whatever, a function that takes an n1s. A note, this is not in the namespace, this is outside the namespace. I still call g with an s. Then this is actually an ambiguous function call. Argument independent lookup also considers the according namespace. So n1 is also looked up. But still, this is called in a global namespace, so also all the functions in the global namespace are valid candidates. So I pick up all the functions f, and unfortunately, these two are basically the same. So now we didn't talk about overload resolution yet, 
But intuitively, you would say probably that a compiler cannot make a decision here. So this now results in an ambiguous function call. So the takeaways is argument independent lookup does not mean that I just look in this according namespace, but also, and additionally, argument independent lookup only works for class types, user defined class types. So there is another mechanism that is sometimes mentioned, and it unfortunately is sometimes confusing. I actually shouldn't call it another mechanism, just a consistent usage of the rules, but still, people are confused by this. So I now added this function here. So in the clone namespace, I now have an f that takes a double, I have an f that takes an int. In between, there's still the old function g. Additionally, I have my s with f for s functions one, two, and three. In the main function, I still call g with s. And just as before, this will call function three based on argument-dependent lookup. The second g, however, for some people surprisingly, does not call function two. It calls function one. It should call function one, I should say, because um, until pretty recently, for instance, Microsoft Visual Studio did not do this properly. This is the so-called two-phase lookup. If G is instantiated with a specific type, all the ordinary rules apply. If you pass a class type, so S for instance, argument and lookup can be used, I can pick up function two. But if I pass a fundamental type like this int, then the regular rules should apply. Only those functions that have been seen before the template should be considered for calling. And so this function actually should never be considered. The only function that can be called is function one. And so this is should be the real result. So even if instantiated template, and of course it is instantiated late, still the regular rules apply. That is enti the entire um, reason behind two-phase lookup. So what do you read about two-phase lookup? So remember that ADL only works for user-defined types. So let's see if you got the key points. And I have to admit that um, I said I give trainings, but thanks to the corona crisis, a lot of my training classes got canceled. And I had a little time. And I tried to find different ways to make a little extra money. And I think I came up with just the right thing. So I would now if this would be an on-site meetup, ask who knows this particular computer game. I believe a couple of people would raise their hand, um, probably not everyone, but a few. This actually is one of these pretty successful online shooter games. Um, I think you have to pay money. I have to admit I didn't uh, play it myself, but I realized it's pretty successful. And so I came up with a much better idea. An idea that will revolutionize the entire C++ community, I give you overload. And I know, I can now imagine that um, everybody is absolutely fascinated. The crowd goes wild, standing ovations. But wait, you haven't seen it yet. Let me give you a teaser, a little teaser of this absolutely fantastic family game. Indeed, it is a family game. It doesn't have to be your own, of course. So. I think this is a structure and a kind of a game that you can um, imagine what it is like. So you're given a question and you're supposed to give the right answer. And you have four choices. So first allow me to um, pose the question. So we have a namespace N1 with a struct S and a struct S um, give, is um, accompanied by an equal swap function. So this swap swaps to S. This is my function one. Then this swap function here outside namespace n1 swaps to s also. So n1s here and n1 is here as well. I have a function template g that takes two t some things and swaps these two things. Now, when I create 2s and call g, which function is called? Is it function one? Is it function two? Is it a compilation error? Okay, come on, we are in C++. 
is it um, neither one or nor C, uh, neither one nor two? Okay, think about this for a couple of seconds. I kind of miss the puzzled faces now. Oh, this would be fun. And you do realize this is a fun game, do you? Oh, this is amazing. So I believe mo many of you have um, um, come up to uh, with an uh, with a um, with a guess. So this is. D, of course. Why is it D? Well, because I use std swap. This function and this function is never considered. I use the standard namespace. Ah, so, qualified lookup. What I should have done in this case, probably, is not use std explicitly, but instead ask the compiler to consider std but call swap unqualified this would have done the right thing it would have found an s and but then it would have been a compilation error because of an ambiguity this is the right way to use swap this is what usually is recommended so perhaps there's another takeaway prefer unqualified name lookup to qualified name lookup and also consider c165 that says use using for customization points um, so indeed, this is the right way to call functions, especially free functions. Okay, let's do another one, shall we? So, I now have a base class. The base class is, uh, it comes with two functions f. The first function f takes an int, the second one takes a double. This time, these two functions are virtual. And again, I call them function one and two. I now introduce a derived class that public derives from base. And it overrides the function f that takes a double. I call this function three. Now I create a derived object. And on this object d, I call f and I pass the value 12. Okay, obviously an integer. Which function is called? Is it function one? Or is it function two? Perhaps function three? Or is this just a compilation error? Okay, again, think about this for a couple of seconds. I'm pretty sure you can beat this one. All right, so perhaps as a hint, this is an example that I use in my courses. And I would bet that 50 to 60% at least of the participants, with very, very few exceptions, are, uh, yeah, with convic uh, very convinced say this calls function one. Unfortunately, it doesn't. This calls function three. And there's a very simple reason for that. I am calling f on the derived object. So the first scope that I'm looking in is this one. And I told you that name lookup finds all the functions in the according scope and then stops. This is the only function that the name lookup comes up with. And of course, later I find that I actually can call it by converting this int to the double. Function three hides both function one and two, or we could say at least function one because um, it overrides function two. Again, name hiding is in effect here. Name ID is not just the namespaces. It also is a problem within classes. And this is probably one of the most um, common problems uh, with name hiding um, that, uh, uh, yeah, that, that people experience. So remember name hiding both in scopes, uh, both in uh, namespace scope, but also in class scope. So victory, you have definitely mastered the first um, couple of questions, which means we can move on and perhaps there's a couple of questions. Hey, um, yeah, there's one, um, what's the URL for the game? <laughs> okay. All right, no. Um, so there was one question, um, is there a way to force a qualified lookup to overloaded operators in, in a namespace, apart from explicitly calling them, e.g. n1 colon colon operator? Slash, uh, operator uh, stream, for instance. So I'm not aware how to use qualified lookup without using qualified lookup. 
so perhaps I'm wrong, perhaps somebody else knows something, but unfortunately, um, I'm not aware of any mechanism that allows you to call something very specific without saying what specific you want to call. So this is what um, the, the uh, qualified lookup is for. But of course, I totally understand that this is pretty inconvenient because writing an operator in um, explicitly, so probably something like in one colon colon operator something um, is not nice. But no, I, I unfortunately don't, don't know any solution here. Okay. okay, cool. And then uh, we have a question for slide number 27. All right, let me uh, go back real quick. This might be easier, yes. Okay, and that is, uh, why is the, the fourth function not called? So in this example, we call, um, so where were I, so let me show, so why is it not called? Well. Argument-dependent lookup considers both the global namespace now, and it considers also the um, the, um, the namespace n one. So the argument, uh, the, the namespace for of the argument. I find both function three and four. Both are equally well matched. We'll talk about overall resolution in just a couple of minutes. The compiler cannot make a decision whether three or four is better. Both are perfectly fine. So this just result, results in a so-called ambiguous function call. Neither three nor four is better. Okay, I hope this answers the question. Else, um, yeah. please just- Otherwise, just uh, specify again. Yeah. Um, all right. Cool, thanks. So those yeah, were all sure. the questions. I have one remark. Um, you seem to be pointing at, at functions every now and then, saying this, this function, this function, something like that. Um, we don't see any pointers. Oh, this is unfortunate because I've extra one of these um, smart pointers. I don't know <laughs> how else to say it. Um, so that's a good hint. Thank you very much. I assume that this is visible um, in the in the recording. Okay, I will um, describe this more verbally. Thank you. Okay. Cool. So let's continue with the next step, which is template argument deduction. And I already announced this is something that I simply don't have to time to, uh, the time to go into detail. So I just point you towards people that know this better and uh, talks where you can get all the information. If you want to learn about template argument deduction in pretty much all the details, then C++ type deduction and why you care is the talk to go to. Um, Scott Myers at this point does not look like he's very happy, but indeed he is doing an amazing job of explaining how template argument deduction works. The good uh, news of this uh, talk is that for most cases, it's really intuitive and does exactly what it would expect. The only case where it probably does not do what you expect is forwarding references. But this is kind of expected. This is the most complex case. So please go to this talk in order to learn about how templates are actually instantiated, how arguments are deduced. There is one more detail that a lot of people probably want to know about. And that is the so-called Sphine mechanism. Sphine is a mechanism that may or may not discard templates during the instantiation. Some templates simply just may not fit. They're discarded without any problem, yeah, without any error. And that is the, the full wording of Sphine. Substitution failure is not an error. Arthur did a tremendous job of explaining how Sphine works. And as the subtitle um, suggests, subsol, a very small quantity of something, this is supposed to be a beginner's talk. It's not really a beginner's topic, but he does a good job uh, explaining it such that uh, you can understand it if you've never heard about this before. So again, I'm sorry, I just don't have the time to go into detail here. And so we continue to the next big step, overload resolution. And this is indeed a big step. The standard itself has 30 to 40 pages reserved just for overload resolution. And of course, here I also cannot deal with all the details, but I can give you hopefully a pretty good idea how things work in general. Overload resolution works in two steps also. The first step is to compile a list of given candidates. So all the candidates that have uh, the net name lookup has found and all the candidates has, that have been added in template argument deduction to compile this list and to select so-called viable candidates. 
So what does this mean? Here's an example. So I just call a function f with an integer. Then viable candidates could be a function that just takes an int. That's simple. That's a so-called exact or identity match. Then it could be a function that takes a reference to a constant int. Okay, it's a little more complex. We call this a trivial conversion. We have to add const, but still, this is a perfectly uh, valid function to call. Then, of course, I could call a function that expects me to do a conversion. So I could convert the integer into a double. I could also convert the integer to a class type. If the class type, so here at the top, um, widget has a non-explicit uh, constructor that allows a conversion from int to widget. So a user-defined conversion, possible. Then I could call functions that have more, argument, uh, more parameters than have arguments, but some of these have default arguments. So still, I can call this function with my one um, integer. This is a viable candidate. It could also be some function that is constrained reasonably. So a constraint that I fulfill with my integer. So for instance, this um, function expects any integral type. Well, an integer matches that. I could call that one. And last but not least, I could also call function with ellipses arguments. I have to admit that I do not know when I would use this nowadays, but theoretically speaking, this is one of the options. However, there could also be non-viable candidates. So some functions might simply not make any sense. For instance, a function with less parameters than I have arguments. So zero in this case, I couldn't call that one. I can also not call functions with more parameters than I have arguments. I cannot uh, magically have uh, get an, a second argument. I can also not call functions that provide me no conversion whatsoever to um, the, uh, the expected type. So I can never uh, convert an int into a string. This is not a viable candidate. And last but not least, of course, also uh, functions that are constrained such that my type doesn't work are also not viable. So here, this function would expect a floating point type. Int is the wrong type. This is not viable. So a lot of functions might be gone at this point, but a lot of functions might remain, yeah, a lot of viable candidates. And so the second step now is to actually decide which of these viable candidates is the best match, which fits the given argument best. And to simplify this and to explain it, I start simple. We assume now a single argument, not multiple arguments. I'll explain how this works uh, at the end but let's assume a single argument. Now the compiler is choosing the best option. The best thing that can happen is an exact or so-called identity match. Okay, the second best thing that can happen is a so-called trivial conversion. These two are actually ranked as rank one. So what we're talking about now is called ranking. These two kinds of um, argument uh, conversions or uh, this, these two kinds of functions would be ranked as one. The next best thing would be a so-called promotion or perhaps a promotion with a trivial conversion, like adding a const. This is uh, ranked as two. And then the next best thing would be any other standard conversion or a standard conversion with trivial conversion. This is rank three. The next level is user-defined conversions, or of course, user-defined conversions with trivial conversions, or user-defined conversions with standard conversions. Officially, they do not have a rank, but as the standard itself specifies, a user-defined conversion is always considered worse than a standard conversion. So perhaps for our purpose here, unofficially, this is a rank four, and that's even a rank five, and that is ellipsis arguments. So unofficially rank five. So I'm now ranking based on um, the given arguments, the things that I need to do to call the function. So simple example, again, I have an int. I call a function with this int. Function one is a function that takes an int ref. Function two is a function that takes a double. Function one is actually a pretty good match. 
a so-called identity match. Um, I don't have to add const, so I just pass it by reference. This is a rank one function. In order to call function two, I would have to convert the int into double. This is only rank three, the standard conversion. And so in this case, it's absolutely certain that I call function one, the function that has the lower rank, uh, is ranked best, kind of. That is simple. However, of course, um, in reality, the situation is never that simple. Consider, for instance, the, the third function here, a function that takes a const int ref. Now, function one still is an identity match. Function two still is a standard conversion. But function three, well, it, it's a trivial conversion. I merely have to add const, which, however, officially is ranked one, two. Now, function one and three kind of compete with each other. One of these, hopefully, is the better match. However, based on the rank, I cannot make a decision at this point. What I need now is some tiebreaker. And I believe that intuitively you would argue function one should be called. I have a non-constant here. And indeed, this is what, ha what is happening, but not automatically. In order to show you how this um, looks like, I go to CPP reference because I believe this is what more people use than uh, the actual standard. And there is an explicit page for overload resolution, which is actually pretty readable. Don't be afraid, go there, take a look. It's rather lengthy, however. So um, you have uh, probably need some time to read all the details, but you will eventually come to a subsection that says ranking of implicit conversions. It also mentions exact match, promotion, conversion, all these different ranks that exist. And it also provides tiebreakers, special rules that apply if a rank is the same. So you know here at three, a standard conversion sequence S1 is better than a standard conversion uh, sequence S2 if, now we have to scroll down a little more, uh, uh, the um, point E is the one that we are interested in. If both S1 and S2 are binding to reference parameter, are binding to a reference parameter only, different in top-level CV qualification. And S1's type is less CV qualified than S2's. The example below is exactly the case that we have. So the two Fs, they take different kinds of references. I pass an int, the function that takes a non cons reference. So here it's um, the second function from top is called. This is exactly the example that we have here. So thanks to this tiebreaker, I can make a decision and call function one. So tie breakers are pretty important. Else, many of the usual reasonable um, cases would not work easily. However, by now you also see that, of course, ambiguities can happen. And now you understand how they happen. So imagine that I have, again, uh, an int. I pass int to the f. I have two functions at top. One takes a float, one takes a double. Well, based on the rank, both functions are actually the same. Both functions require me to do a standard conversion. Both are ranked three. There is no special rule for this case, however. So both are considered equally good. I could convert the int to float. I could convert it to double. No special case. This is an ambiguous function call. No, same rank, no special rule. There's perhaps one other case that is definitely worth to highlight. Templates versus non-templates. I have a function one, a regular function that takes an integer, and I function two, a constraint function that takes any integral type. During type deduction, this function of course is instantiated accordingly, and I come up with essentially this function here. So this is function two after instantiation. This is the function I could actually call. If you take a look at these functions, given that I have again an argument of type int, then this here is an identity match. Perfect. But this one is also an identity match. These two functions virtually are identical. After template argument deduction, I have the very same thing. And this can actually happen due to um, templates. 
Also in this case, there exists a rule. And I feel this is a pretty important rule to remember because this, of course, if you work with templates, um, comes up pretty often. If you go to the overload resolution page again, you have to scroll down again, this time to best viable function. And this explains the special case. So F1 is determined to be a better function than F2. If implicit conversion of for all arguments F1 are not worse than the implicit conversions for all arguments F2 and, and here comes the special case, F1 is a non-template function, while F2 is a template specialization. So in the name, in, um, in the terminology of the standard template specialization is template instantiation, those are valid, valid terms here. If F1 is not a template, but F2 is, comes from a template, then F1 wins. So in this special case, the non-template is preferred. Also something that a lot of people um, do not know, now you do, non-templates have preference, but only if indeed the two have the same rank. And this usually is rank one because templates tend to be instantiated such that they fit perfectly. So this is an, a tiebreaker for uh, identity matches. All right, I mentioned promotions. Promotions are a special kind of conversion. For instance, I can convert an unsigned int to, uh, I'm sorry, an unsigned short to an unsigned int rent. This actually depends on the platform. I can convert a short to an int. I can convert a char to an int, or unsigned int, again, depending on the platform. And I can convert bool to int. These four integral uh, conversions are actually special. This is why they're called promotion. A promotion is the best kind of conversion. If you have a function that takes an int and you have smaller uh, types, then a promotion takes place. There's also one case for floating points. A float can be promoted to a double. However, all other kinds of, um, of conversions are not promotions. Even if this is kind of surprising, um, so for instance, a float to long double also makes it bigger, but still it is rated a standard conversion, not a promotion. So this is indeed a couple of special cases. So for instance, just giving a couple of examples, if I have a short S, then function one would actually be an integral promotion, rank two, whereas the, promo uh, the, the conversion to double is just a standard conversion, rank three. Obviously, function one is called because it has the lower rank. If the given uh, argument would be of type float, then the first function would be a standard conversion, rank three, but the second function would be a promotion, rank two. This time function two is, by just taking a look at the rank, the better function to call, floating point promotion. Everything else is standard conversions. And of course, there is a lot of different kinds of conversions. There's conversions between integral types, conversions between floating point types. There is conversions from integral to floating point and also from floating point to integral. I can convert pointers either within class hierarchies or to void. And there's also something called bool conversion. Expressions can be converted to bool. So as a simple example, an obvious example, I can convert an unsigned int to a double. This will be standard conversion. I can call this function. Perhaps a little counterintuitively, however, is that this here is not a special case at all. So I take an int, I have an unsigned int down here. Well, of course I call this function, but it's nothing but a standard conversion. And so this is just rank three nothing better than uh, the example before. Okay, if you have a class hierarchy, again, conversions are possible. So let's assume that I have struct A, um, which is an empty base class. Um, I have struct B, which derives from A, and have C that derives from B. Function one takes an A pointer. Function uh, two takes a B pointer. I have a C and I'm calling f with the address of c. Well, again, this is a pointer conversion, standard conversion rank three. This is also a pointer conversion, rank three. 
But of course, again, intuitively, it makes sense that the second function is called. And so also here exists a tiebreaker that basically says that the second function is closer from a pointer conversion point of view. So, okay, same rank, but again, a tiebreaker to make it uh, clear which of these two functions is called. And just also to mention conversions to bool, I have a function one now that takes a bool. I have a function two that takes an int. And in the main function, I actually have a pointer type. This calls function one. This calls function one because calling the function um, that takes a bool is um, rank three, bool conversion. The second function is not even a viable function. I cannot convert a pointer to an int. This is not viable. So this will simply call function one. If, however, I would provide a function that takes a pointer, a void pointer, for instance, then this would be a pointer conversion, rank three again. Luckily, there's a tiebreaker again, and there's many, so you will have, uh, you, you will need some time to look through all of them. Um, this would now call function three. A pointer conversion is considered better than a conversion to bool for pointers, which again sounds kind of reasonable. This is explained again in the ranking um, subchapter, and we have to scroll down to this particular case here. If two conversion sequences are indistinguishable because they have the same rank, following additional rule supply, conversion that involves pointer to bool or pointer to member to bool is worse than the, uh, the one that doesn't. So conversion to bool is considered worse than the alternative, which is pointer conversion here. Um, so this also should give a clear result. So I see there's a lot of questions. Um, um, we'll have a questions at the end of um, overload resolution. Allow me to mention user-defined conversions. User-defined conversions are uh, provided by means of constructors usually non-explicit constructors and uh, conversion operators, non-explicit conversion operators. So this widget can be uh, created by means of an int or a double or anything that would convert to these two. And I could vice versa also convert a widget into an int or double or something that is um, uh, convertible from these two. Just to give a few examples, because of course there is an infinite amount of um, possibilities here. Let's say that I have a struct widget that provides a constructor that takes an int. The constructor is not, uh, not um, defined or qualified with explicit. I have an f that takes a long and I have an f that takes a widget. In the main function, I call function f with an integer. Function one, is ranked as a standard conversion. Function two, in this example, is actually worse. It's just a user-defined conversion. User-defined conversions are always considered less uh, good, so lower rank than standard conversions. So this will always call function one. Also, this is very clearly stated in the standard and also a little more nicely in CP reference, a standard conversion sequence is always better than a user-defined conversion sequence or an ellipsis conversion sequence. Yeah, ellipsis would be even worse. All right, so slightly different example. Now we have a widget with two constructors. One takes an int, one takes a double. I have a function f that takes a widget and I call function f with an int. Well, of course I need to convert the int into widget before I can call a function. Because my constructors are not explicit, I can do this. The first constructor is considered, and this is just what is called a user-defined conversion. In order to call the second constructor, I would have to do user-defined conversion, but additionally a standard conversion from int to double. So here the conversion sequence for the second function is more complex. It is worse than function one. And so here I call function one. Also this of course is nicely documented in, um, in CP by reference and, and of course also the standard. Um, if I have a short 
s is equal to 42 and I pass the short, then the first function requires me to do a user defined conversion plus a promotion. The second again requires me to do user defined conversion plus a standard conversion. And again, now I believe you have um, completely taken the point. Of course, this now will call function one because a promotion is better than a standard conversion. Now, so this is just um, adding up. So all of these rules now um, are combined. And again, we can read this up in CP reference or nicely in this case here. A user-defined conversion sequence U1 is better than a user-defined conversion sequence U2 if they call the same constructor, blah, 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 blah. So I skip a couple of steps. And in either case, the second standard conversion sequence in U1 is better than the second standard conversion sequence in U2. That's a similar example. Um, it just uses um, a conversion operator here. Um, so now the standard conversion is ranked and promotion just ranks better than um, a promotion ranks better than a standard conversion. Now, hopefully this gave some impression on how uh, to deal with one argument. But of course, this is the simplest case. Now, the simplest case would probably be no argument. But um, of course, there can be many arguments. How does the compiler decide uh, on the best match for many multiple arguments? Well, the rules still apply. But I now consider every single argument in isolation. And then I kind of take a look at the, the complete result. So for several arguments, the compiler applies the same rules to every single argument. If one function is considered better for at least one argument and equally good for all the other arguments, the function is selected as best match. Else, the function is ambiguous. So let me give you an example. Let's say we have two functions. Function one is a function that takes three integers. Function two is a function that takes one int and two double. Of course, the uh, example here is a little artificial now. Function f is called with an int, with a short, and with an unsigned int. Now, the compiler proceeds for every single argument. For the first function, the first argument is a rank one. Perfect match, identity match, or exact match. The same is true for function two. So I cannot make up any difference here. The second argument is a short. Well, for function one, this is actually a promotion, rank two. Whereas for function two, this is a, um, a standard conversion, rank three only. And in the last case, I have an unsigned int, which is a conversion, standard conversion to int, rank three, or a standard conversion to double. No difference here. And if I now take a complete look, then I realize that I cannot make a decision based on the first or the third argument. But the second one is actually better, for, for the second it would be better if I call function one. So in this case, function one is selected as the best match. The total rank, if I would kind of sum them up, for the first one is better. And of course, again, all the rules that I've shown before apply um, and are taken into consideration. If I would change my calling arguments a little bit. If the last one is not an unsigned int, but a float, then I would have an identity match in the first for the first arguments again. I would again have a promotion here and a, a standard conversion here. But now I would have a conversion, standard conversion for function one, but a promotion for function two. Now, no function is a clear better match. For both functions, one of the arguments is better, or yeah, one of the expected, uh, one of the ranks is better than the rank of the other function. The compiler, even if uh, a lot of other things uh, would, uh, would match, makes no decision here anymore. This is now automatically an ambiguous function call. No decision is made. Um, you have to make clear which function to call by providing the right kind of arguments. So you realize that um, this can be arbitrarily complex. So perhaps one of the takeaways is prevent complex overloading situations that may result in surprises during overload resolution. And also perhaps consider C163 uh, overload only for operations that are roughly equivalent.
so on. Not have all the functions that um, um, sound kind of similar should have the same name. Very often, these complex situations can be resolved by providing the functions with different names. All right, fun time. Let's see if you got the key points. And again, we play one round of overload. Are we ready? Okay, I, I kind of uh, expect that all of you now say yes. So, I have two functions. Function one takes an int, function two takes a double. I call the function a function with an unsigned int. Which of these two functions is called? Is it function one? Is it function two? Is it a compilation error? Or is it just undefined behavior? So I definitely hope that after what I've told you so far, you immediately see what this will be. So if you decided for C, you're absolutely correct. Concrete relations, you got the point. Although intuitively, most people argue that an unsigned int can be much easier converted into an int, it still is ranked um, a standard conversion. Rank three, this is just also a standard conversion. Rank three, there's no tiebreaker. And so this is an ambiguous function call. Okay, perfect. I think you got it. Um, victory again. And now I can take a couple of questions again. Yeah, well, there are, uh, there are a couple of questions um, and one one longer uh, attempt to, to look into function pointers. Oh, my. Right, so. <laughs> Only 60 minutes, right? <laughs> yeah. No, so yeah. so, so let, let's see what we, what we do there. Um, but maybe let's start with a simple one first. Um, how to call base class virtual function? Um, is that done using base class pointer assigned to the derived class object? Or how does it work? So I assume the question means that I have an implementation at base class and I have an implementation of the same virtual function in the derived class. Still, I would like to call the base version. What you can do here is again to use qualified um, a qualified function call. So what you can say is, say you have a pointer, unfortunately you cannot write now. So a uh, function pointer, then the little arrow, then you name your class, base, colon, colon, function name. This will disable the virtual dispatch and it will always call the base um, implementation of the function. Hopefully there is an implementation. This is one classic way of calling a, uh, a pure virtual function. Okay. Okay. Right. So in the the uh, function pointer question starts simple. Um, is will the okay. same rules be applied in case of using a pointer to function? Um, a pointer to function is an address to specific function already. Um, so if you have a pointer to a function, you will call this particular function. Um, to some extent, the all the work has already been done. If you have to figure out which function pointer you need, then perhaps uh, before that, there is already a um, something going on, like overload resolution, etc. But as soon as you have a function pointer, this is the address of a particular specific function. None of these uh, mechanisms would uh, would apply then. Okay. Okay. I hope this. Uh, in particular, if you if you pass a pointer to a function into some other function and you call that. Uh, that pointer there, then there is no no additional name lookup and whatnot. Correct. We just, we Correct. just have the exact address. Correct. Okay. Um, right. So uh, to to uh, totus fiat uh, in this case, I I suggest that we just uh, stop the discussion here in the talk at this point. Um, and uh, if there are details that you would like to ask in addition, then maybe use the after talk chat. Okay, I, I'll definitely be there. Um, I'm happy to take any kind of additional question. Okay, thank okay, you. Okay, cool. Um, then there's a question. If template argument deduction produces identical code, 
wouldn't it intuitively get removed during that code removal phase by the compiler? So identical code, this is where I now struggle a little bit. Um, at this point, I do not take a look at the inside of the function. I basically just um, instantiate the, the, the signature and see if this is a function that it matches. If indeed the, um, the function template argument deduction process comes up with a function with almost the exactly same signature, um, if both functions, the non-template and the template result in the same rank, this is just the tiebreaker that the non-template wins. So I'm not exactly sure um, which code should be removed uh, because at this point, I do not look at the inside of the function. Um, perhaps this is also something that we could um, discuss in more detail later. I'm, I'm very happy to, to try to answer this. Okay, cool. Um, when there is an ambiguous function call, is there a, compil is there a compiler error or will a random function be called? <laughs> Okay, um, of course it's a compilation error. An ambiguous function call means that the compiler reports that it cannot make a decision um, which function to call. So perhaps this is a good addition to the talk. Thank you for this, for this question. Um, of course, the compiler tells me explicitly that it cannot make a decision. And the error message, first of all, says ambiguous function call, blah, blah, blah. But it also now lists all the uh, viable functions that could potentially be called in order to show all the functions that a compiler could choose from. Usually the compiler also tells you which are uh, the two functions or potentially, of course, more functions that uh, really um, um, prohibited the decision, but it usually also shows all the other candidates. And this is sometimes even a good way to get an, uh, an idea of the set of viable functions. Sometimes I kind of misuse that in order to see all of them. Um, Sometimes it's a bad idea, uh, especially for output operators. But um, no, this short question, uh, short answer, um, this will produce a compilation error. Okay, cool. I think that's all for the moment. Okay, thank you. So, which means we can go to the next step. The forward resolution step has now come up with exactly one function. However, there is still a couple of details that we have to check. For instance, access labels. It could be a member function. And this member function could be behind um, an access label. This is also one of the, I shouldn't say riddles, uh, one of the questions that I ask my courses. And I'm also I'm almost always surprised how many people do not um, know the answer to that question. I create an object, so some, some class, and I call a function on this object 1.0. The object itself has two functions called f. The first function takes an int, it's in the public part, function one. And I have a second function f that takes a double in the private part of object, yeah, function two. Think about this perhaps for a couple of seconds. Which function is called here? Well, the intuitive answer that indeed, again, more than 50% of people give is, of course, it's function uh, function one. What else, which other functions sh uh, should, should matter? This is the only public function. No, unfortunately not. It calls function two indeed. Or I should say it would call function two, but of course it cannot because it's a private function. We get another kind of compilation error, so-called excess violation. Perhaps, however, you've already realized why that is. We have already selected a function by this point. Only now I start to take a look at the access labels. So first I run the name lookup, it finds both. Then I run the overload resolution, it selects function two. And only as a third step in this, in this shortened uh, cycle, I um, uh, realized that function two is private. The access labels are checked very, very late in this process, only after I've already decided on a function. The rationale for that, however, is actually a pretty good one. It is supposed to give you consistent uh, behavior. Imagine, for instance, that I call this function f from within the object. If I do that, of course, nobody would um, um, 
complain, everybody would say this calls function two, correct. But if I now call the same function from the outside, it would give me different behavior if function one would be selected. That is something that Björn himself decided is unreasonable very, very early in the development of C++. That is the reason why access labels are only checked after the overload resolution. This, however, is something that you definitely should keep in mind. The, um, the access label is not really an ex a, a visibility label, as many people believe. It truly really just is an access label. All the functions in your class are always visible for everybody. They're just not accessible. And the same is true for everything inside a class. Everything is visible, just not accessible. This, by the way, is the reason why in C++20 we will get a new keyword called glass, the glass keyword, which very nicely expresses that this is a glass object. I can see everything, everything that's inside this object. Okay, and I hope that most of you realize this is a joke. I, I like this very much because changing C to G actually works nicely here, but okay, uh, just a joke. Do not cl uh, quote me on, we will get a class keyword. Okay, um, remember that everything inside a class is visible. Public, protected, and private emerity access labels. Okay, and this is, I believe, the one takeaway from um, access labels. Um, perhaps it's too too soon for questions at this point. Or is there any access label related question? None that I can see. Okay, so then let's proceed. Let's go to function template specialization. In this step, I actually make a another decision. Perhaps the chosen function is a template and perhaps this function has specializations. The first thing that uh, you realize is this is happening very, very late in the process. So only very late, I actually decide which, um, which uh, specialization of a function template I apply. So I have an example again. The first function is a function template that takes a template parameter t and um, yeah, takes an argument of type t also, the parameter type t. Function two is now a specialization of function one. So I specialize for the special case of char pointers. Function three is again a base um, function template. It um, takes a T star, um, and so it's a different function than function one. In the main function, I have a char pointer, and I call function F with this pointer. Surprisingly, it is um, not function two that is called, but it is calling function three. Te function template specializations are only considered after I have selected a base template. So during the, um, the overload resolution, only function one and three are considered because two is just, in quotation marks, a specialization. Which of the two, uh, one or three is better? Well, three is for pointers, one is not. Sure, one could take pointers too, but three is just better. It is more specialized, which is again, a completely different set of rules to, um, to deal with templates. But function three is selected. Now I come to the function template specialization step. I look for specializations, but there is none. Two is a specialization of one, but I've selected three, so three is called. Surprisingly, if I now switch these two lines, the behavior is pretty different because now function two is actually a specialization of function three. So the order definitely matters. Function two is now a specialization for function three. Function three, um, I call the function. Function three is selected first, and now it has a specialization. Now function two is selected. And so, indeed, function template specializations are kind of special. Note, last remark, and perhaps a, a last example to push a little bit away from function template specializations. There is another syntax. You can also, can also explicitly spe um, specify the, the type you're specializing for. Now, surprisingly, perhaps by mistake, I have made this a specialization of function template one again. So T and T and one 
becomes char pointer and char pointer. This matches the signature of one, not of three. And so now this calls function three again. Function template specializations are truly special. Let's call them special. Um, and as a very uh, simple um, key point, uh, you should probably uh, stay away from them and prefer overloading. This doesn't mean that you should never use them, but use them only when um, you truly get the result that you're looking for. Okay, but again, I have a couple of questions. Uh, oh, at least one question. So we have the example from um, just the slide before. We have functions one, two, and three. I call this function by passing null pointer. Which function is called? One, two, or three? So one, two, or three, or doesn't it um, call any function? Okay. Hopefully you have come to some, um, some conclusion. It is function one. Why function one? Okay, I admit, this is a very mean question. What is the type of null pointer? No, it's not a pointer. It's null pointer T. That does not fit any pointer type, but it perfectly fits function one. Function one is called and it will, in this form, definitely always be function one. Okay, I admit, this was mean, but uh, to some extent, I'm a mean person. So prefer function overloading to function template specialization. Okay, any questions on function template specialization, Roland? Um, more of a question on the agenda. Do you plan yeah. to elaborate on virtual function implementation behind private access label? Unfortunately, no. Um, I'm already over time anyway. So um, I will have to shorten this for CppCon. But that's the, exactly what I wanted to, to try out. Um, no, unfortunately not. Okay, that's all for now. All right. So we have now dealt with function template specialization. The next step would be, in case we have a virtual function, to um, deal with virtual functions directly. So what is the actual um, proper implementation of the function call? And I said that I'm going to skip this step. But I can give you a very, very nice reference. It is a pretty old recording of Stefan, um, but it is a very good recording. This is not just the only one. There's a couple of talks called Core C++. You find them online at YouTube. Um, I really recommend them because um, this is probably the best and most um, um, complete material on this entire process of calling functions. I do not recommend these talks, however, if you do not like cats. Stefan has the, um, uh, has the habit to name everything after cats. So class cat, class kitty, function meow. So if you do not like cats, you should better stay away from, the, from these talks. Else, great recordings, really recommended. Okay, but again, I have to skip this step. All more important is perhaps to talk about deleting functions. Because also here I find misconceptions and misunderstandings. So again, I come with two functions, function one, which takes an int, and a function that takes a double. That function is explicitly deleted. Now, the first thing I do in a main function is I call function f with a 42. This function calls function, or this call calls function one. Okay, but now we totally understand why. If, however, now I call the function f with a 1.0, then this does not call function one because function two is deleted. No, no, no. This will try to call function two, but since it's deleted, this will be a compilation error again. The error message will tell you, some, will tell you that you're trying to call a deleted function. You cannot call a deleted function, so it's a compilation error. The word delete suggests that the function is gone, deleted. To some extent, unfortunately, this is a misnomer. This delete means that the function cannot be called. So if you try to call it, uh, you will um, get a compilation error. So equal delete doesn't delete a function, but it declares it as uncallable. Any attempt to call a function will result in a compilation error. This indeed has some interesting um, um, uh, repercussions. 
So something that you read about often is that you should delete uh, special member functions if you don't need them. But interestingly, this may have a different effect than what you have in mind. So consider this uh, widget class. It has a default constructor. It has a copy constructor and it has a move constructor. To explain the things here, I've explicitly deleted the move constructor. Now I have a widget W1 default constructed. And now I try to move W1 into W2. This will not um, um, uh, call the, the copy constructor. No, it will give you a compilation error because you try to move and that is prohibited. Whenever you try to move, you will get a compilation error. But if I would get rid of this line, then suddenly this line here would just call the copy constructor. So deleting something explicitly has a different meaning that in this particular case than not writing it. And so this is indeed sometimes reason to not use the rule of th uh, five, but rather the rule of three. If you want to explicitly express that move should be copy, then of course you could implement the function and do the copy, but you could also just leave it, but not delete it, because delete says something different. With this, you explicitly prohibit calling this function. So the rule of five, in case you want to read about this, is C21, one of the probably most common, commonly um, used core guidelines. So which brings us to an end. I hope I could give you a pretty complete overview of this entire function call process. True, I could not go into a lot of detail. There is much more to, to learn about, many more rules for overload resolution, etc., and of course, many, many more possible combinations of things. However, you should now have an understanding, general idea of how name lookup works, how overload resolution works, why access labels are checked afterwards, um, that function template specializations are indeed kind of special and that deleting functions does not mean that the functions are gone. So I hope this was helpful. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, I'm definitely happy to answer a couple of more questions. Hey, uh, we currently have one more question. It's again, uh, more of an infrastructure question. Uh, are you planning to share the, sh the slides? I can definitely do that. Um, we've done this a couple of times um, in, in the past also. But also note that this recording will be immediately available. Okay, I shouldn't say immediately. Will soon be available at um, Twitch. So you can watch the talk again. And we will also um, publish the talk in our YouTube channel. By the way, you should register for both the video, uh, the, the, the Twitch channel and the YouTube channel. It's something that helps us indeed. Um, but I can also definitely extra uh, publish the slides, no problem. So I will, when I do that, uh, um, put the decoding link into the uh, Meetup event page. Right. And this was a test run for CPPCon. So um, CPPCon will also publish the, the video and the slides, I guess. Absolutely. This one, however, was definitely longer. Um, I stopped the time. So yeah, um, I will have to shorten this a little bit, which means um, this is definitely the more complete version. Cool. All right. Right. Um, so we have a couple of thank yous, um, but no more questions right now. Um, okay, fine. Compliments so on, on a great talk. OK. I would definitely like to see a few of you in the after talk chat. Okay. All right. Thank you very much.